Welcome, everybody. Oh my goodness, I'm excited today. Welcome to the Brave Healing Podcast, where the mission is to change the world one brave word at a time. Thank you guys so much for being here to listen in. I am your hostess, Laura DeFranco, and man, do I have some extra special healing badassery in store for you in this episode. Today, I have with me Susan Purvis. Hello. I have Sarah Nani Williams. Aloha. I have Kaniki Jakarta. And I have Miss Jeanette Stewart with me. And what do these four goddesses have in common? They are all co authors of The Ultimate Guide to Self Healing, Volume Two, you guys. So listen. I woke up on March 20th after spending a couple weeks in actual panic over COVID and my physical therapy business completely being shut down. I woke from a dream with the idea of this collaborative book project. The world needed to understand how to heal at home all of a sudden. And I happen to know a lot of amazing healers. So I went to Facebook that morning uh, to a group that I run for one of my classes and I typed in there, ladies, who wants to contribute a chapter to this book? In 48 hours, I had all 24 yeses for that mm -hmm. first volume. And five weeks later, you guys, that book was born. So what I'm trying to explain to people about this project is that it has a way bigger energy than me. Like that's you know, barely humanly possible that you would get a book born into the world in five weeks with 25 people. So the ultimate guide to self-healing was born. We were a number one Amazon international bestseller in the chronic pain category uh, very quickly. And I'm very proud to announce that we are about to get volume two into the world. So let me introduce you to these amazing author experts that I have here today. Um, they are stellar human beings, and you're going to love hearing what they're going to be writing about. Miss Jeanette Stewart is an emissary of joy at Angel Angles and well-being and wonder. Ooh, that's an addition to your bio, Miss Jeanette. What's, what, yes. I don't remember the well-being and wonder. I like that. Yes, my friends and I have a side business called Wellbeing and Wonder, and we help women um, with self-care needs, and uh, we used to hold live events. Um, I love it. I love the word yeah. wonder. Okay, let me read the rest. She is a number one best-selling author, blogger, military mom, and pancreatic Pan the, yeah, easy for me to say. <laughs> Pancreatic cancer survivor um, who assists you to own your innate divinity and thrive. Gentleness and joy are her superpowers. How good does that sound? Miss okay. um, Susan Purvis saves lives and teaches others to do the same. She's explored the hottest, highest, and coldest places on the planet as a wilderness medicine specialist explorer and educator. Her memoir, Go Find, My Journey to Find the Lost and Myself, tells the story of training and deploying her search dog, Tasha, in the high country of Colorado. And we have Dr. Sarah Nani Williams. She's an author, psychologist, E. EMDR, I was afraid I was going to get that wrong, those initials wrong, EMDR certified and Hawaiian energetics practitioner. She's worked with clients for 15 years and specializes in learning disabilities, anxiety, depression, and trauma. Dr. Sarah created, oh, I'm going to butcher this one, Le Lehualani, go ahead and say it for me, Sarah. Lehualani Center. Thank you. As a nonprofit focused on increasing joy and authenticity in our lives through aloha. Oh my goodness. And we have, last but not least, Kaniki Jakarta is the first black poet laureate of Alexandria, Virginia. She is an award-winning performance poet, author of three novels, two poetry poetry collections, a memoir, and a short story poetry collection entitled Alabama Girl, Virginia Woman. She hosts and facilitates an array of open mics and workshops in person and virtually. Whew! I didn't know I was going to get through all of that. Welcome, mm -hmm. ladies. Thank wow. You. 
<laughs> Thank you for being here. I love doing the group author interviews. Um, we kind of get to know each other sometimes for the first times as you know, being in these big projects together. We are all over the country and all over the world in some instances. And so what I wanted to do is just give our listeners an idea of what's coming up in this book. So um, Kineki, I'm going to start with you. Tell us a little bit about the chapter that you wrote and um, about why you love the topic of decluttering. Well, it was divine that I wrote about that because I was in the midst of decluttering at the time. And, <laughs> and, and ironically, in the midst of reading the first volume of uh, this collection. So I was reading it and, um, you know, we get busy in life and I, I was looking and I was thinking about what I was going to um, contribute to the book. And I was sitting on the edge of my bed and I saw all of the, the piles of clothes that I had from the week. And um, I said, hey, I need to declutter this stuff. So, and the, as you know, when you have things everywhere, look at your life, right? Like even in your purse, look at your purse. Like you're, you know, people say that people's purses are the windows to their soul, right? <laughs> so if you look at your house and you see that things are in disarray, it is, uh, representative of what's going on in your life, right? And if you are a creative person, then you say, let me declutter this stuff and creating a space that you only create in. So that's what I really wanted to focus on. I feel like things hold energy. And if you, like if you have like a prayer prayer work rug, for example, if your prayer work is there and you only pray on it, it holds the energy of prayer, right? Mm -hmm. All the time. So I figure if you create a space that you only create in, it will always give you the energy of creativity. So first you have to declutter your mind, declutter your space, and then create a space that you can create in. So that's pretty much what my, um, my chapter is about. It's about decluttering your mind, decluttering your space, and manifesting creativity for you. So just depending on what it is that you're trying to create. So. I love that you're catching me this week in another round of decluttering. My daughter and I have been working on some spaces in our home that, and even though I had done a lot of it, because you all know, we still collect, it seems. So decluttering is not a one-time thing. You got to just keep working around it. But the thing I that you said that I love the most and, and the, I don't know, the term sacred space is coming to me. When you treat your spaces like that, they do hold a very powerful energy. And um, I mean, all of us here are writers. And so we know that when we create those spaces for ourselves, you feel good. The, the creative flow moves through you. You're connected in a different way. And so I love this topic. So thank you for writing about it. Um, you guys, you know, everyone listening, just know that the authors of this book they're not only teaching a tool in this chapter, but they're also sharing their very authentic stories with you. And I am a believer in that your story, when you're sharing that out loud with people, it heals. It heals you as the teller and it heals people listening to you. Um, and so I kind of want to know from Sarah, Sarah, how did it feel to write this story, to tell this story? Talk to me about storytelling in your life. Um, well, the piece that was really cool about telling this story was that I started off um, in this way that I was struggling in, in, I struggled in the beginning with school and I had a lot of hard times sometimes with that. But what was really cool is when I'm telling a story and the piece that comes to my mind the most actually when I hear, okay, telling a story is the part that when I found the Hawaiian and it's a lot about an oral tradition um, and being able to speak and to have um, a way to speak and talk about something was really powerful for me. Connecting with nature and finding a way to have that as part of my life was so powerful. And then taking it to the next step of then putting it into words and putting it 
taking it from a talk story to putting it into words was a really powerful piece for me. Um, I found in writing this chapter, the part that was really cool was, you know, we start off, we, have, we all have struggles and things that we go through and things that we might be in more survival mode or in sort of a task oriented mindset that we're trying to just get things done. I did that getting my doctoral program done. But then I remember that day that I first went into a Hawaiian class and I felt the possibility and a sense of family. And this, I remember hearing about aloha and a way of living. Um, I was deeply moved um, by the hope of a fuller and more connected way of being. Um, basically, in the chapter and stuff that I talk about is how the Hawaiian culture and the old ways has played a big part in my journey and fully being an aloha. Um, nature and resources are all around us, you know, and it, this chapter brings you to a place where aloha and nature meet. Mm. I love that. You know, every one of you had the challenge uh, because y'all teach your stuff all day long. It's like you could, t you know, you could probably stand at a microphone and give the speech of your tool very easily without too much planning. But there was a challenge in writing it down, right? Into words that the reader could follow and really understand and get an experience out of. And so I appreciate each one of you for taking, first of all, just taking the challenge on and doing that in a written form um, because it's, it's, a little different, you know, um, it can be interesting. Um, but also just knowing that each one of us could have taught 20 tools. I mean, each of you is such a gifted healer and um, business person, and you've been through massive different kinds of experiences, and we all have so many things we could have taught, you know, and so here I was saying, pick one, pick one, you guys, <laughs> you know, let's, <laughs> let's try to just keep it to, to the one thing, so um, thank you all for giving that a shot, you know. Um, Susan, talk to us a little bit about your chapter. Yours was different, and of course, you've written whole books before so you were you know not not a rookie here <laughs> I um, use an excerpt actually out of my book go find and it is um I thought it was pertinent because um, you know when do we when do we get into our power when do we become leaders when do we speak up for ourselves and that was a the chapter that represented to all your readers that there's a time in our life when you have to step into something. And I was a uh, gold exploration geologist by training and I looked for gold in Latin America and all of a sudden this, my life changed when I decided to train a dog to uh, sit, find people lost in the woods. And I ended up getting involved in medicine and medicine was coming at me at all different directions. So I got to see, you know, how traditional medicine is done, Western medicine, but I also got to be mentored by wilderness medicine specialists and alternative healers. And I, Western medicine kind of rubbed me wrong. And um, so I've been on this journey for 25 years, you know, learning how other people heal. But going back to my chapter, um, I, I learned that medicine just wasn't for people who go to medical school, that the lay person, somebody who looks at rocks for a living can learn this stuff too. And I always question, why didn't we learn, you know, this stuff in the seventh grade? And my journey through all this is that the power has been taken away from us. And, you know, we've been told our whole lives, go see a medical doctor, you know, and it turns out, you know, those guys and women, you know, rarely take a nutrition class. And I thought, wow, you know, I can learn this stuff and I can understand it. So my chapter is about empowering the layperson or the professional about um, what's inside your abdomen and how do you determine if abdominal pain is serious or not. And this is the stuff I think seventh graders should learn. <laughs> I love that you um, 
made me think of something that I think about a lot and I think is one of the biggest gifts of this book is that you all believe like I do that it's very important to empower the reader you know, empower people to connect with their inner healer and the things that they can do to help themselves, mind, body, soul, all of the different categories. And so you, were, you just talked about that empowerment. And I think it's an incredibly important idea. Um, oh man, I'm so with you in terms of um, growing up, being taught that I had to go to somebody to fix me. And ugh, I don't even like saying that right now. Like, you know, so I think my whole journey has been about that empowerment. And I love that you talk about that. Um, so you're, tell us a little bit about your book, Go Find. Go Find. So Go Find is my memoir. Um, and it's a, um, me talking about uh, training and deploying a search and rescue dog in the high country of Colorado. I lived at 9,500 feet and I could have made the story just about the missions and the training and all the trouble my little black lab and I got into because <laughs> the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I didn't know anything about training a dog. I didn't know anything about search and rescue and I just kind of jumped into it along with my whole medical career. And then I woke up three years into my writing. As you know, it takes a long time to write a book. I had to answer this question. I wrote this scene. How come it was easier for me to jump out of the side of a helicopter at 11,000 feet with my avalanche dog in my lap to look for a dead guy than it is to talk to my husband about our 18 year relationship? And I'm like, no, no, I have to go back and answer that. So my yeah. whole, you know, as you know, beautiful, writing is beautiful because we never know what's going to happen. And um, so it took me a few more years to get that story down. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. I love that. Why is that? That's a good question. Yeah. Uh, thank you for um, being willing to step up and teach that piece in this, this particular book. Um, you, you could have also like any one of us here, you could have talked about a lot of different things, but um, I appreciated your words. Of course I have, been privy to all of these beautiful authors words already so I have the secrets you guys are gonna have to wait for the book to read these beautiful stories um, Jeanette talk to us about your chapter tell us a little yeah. bit about what you're writing about yes so my chapter is on affirmations and it is stepping into your personal power using um, positivity and so uh, affirmations are such powerful transformational tools. We within us um, have the power to change anything we um, can imagine in our lives. And affirmations are one important tool. I used them last year when I was healing from pancreatic cancer. And I've been writing about them for about the last four years. And it's something that we can all do. It doesn't take very much time. And an important thing is that every thought that we think and every word that we speak is an affirmation. So it, we're putting out there what it is we want more of in life. And so to be mindful of our thoughts and our words um, so that you're cultivating what it is you want more of. This kind of awareness is so important and powerful. I love this topic. I love this kind of awareness and because when you really fine tune it, you realize, well, we, I hope I realize what's coming out of my mouth, you know, what's in my head in terms of my thinking, what's coming out in terms of my actually creating and I think when I really dropped into the power of that, you know, then of course I did want to pay attention to <laughs> what, what those words were. If I knew that that was the act of creating something in my life, right? So we've been taught to, oh, you know, what have you guys been taught? Worst, think about hard. worst case scenario. Yes, that's a good example. 
work um, hard. Yes, yeah. um, I have a really good example of that. Uh, there is a nursery rhyme that talks about the days of the week, uh, Sunday's child, blah, 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 blah. Saturday's child has to work hard for a living in that poem. And both my husband and I are Saturday's child. So I bought into the thought that life was going to be difficult and we had to work doubly hard to get anything that we wanted for several years. And thankfully, I put that mindset behind me. I'm not giving my power away to a nursery rhyme any longer. Wow. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> You know, um, something else that you made me think about in terms of the book in general, and you guys are going to see this, at, at, you know, as you see the other chapters um, and listeners, you're going to, you're going to see the theme and it happened in, in the volume one as well, but there's a theme in this book and affirmations come up several times. And so does the imagination. You mentioned this, Jeanette. Um, paying attention to what your mind is doing, you know, in any given moment with it, with all of these different things. Yeah. Um, I love it. And we talked about this in the other book in terms of, I'm pretty sure every single author in book one talked about breathing, <laughs> you know, breathing being like this just basic way to connect with your body and tune in. And another theme was intuition. And so you saw through the chapters, and this is one of the things I love the most. So I'm going to stick with you, Jeanette, for a minute and ask you, why holistic when it comes to the healing process? Well, I think, um, I think we're on a pendulum um, where when we were young, we were taught there was only the Western medicine. And now um, there's so much uh, information out there. And we are finding that the wisdom of the ages with the Eastern medicine, the native medicine, um, is so healing and so um, powerful and easily accessible and to be connected to the earth and to the divine as well. Um, so to me, it means like whole, to be a whole person, uh, to be present here where I am now, but to be connected to Mother Earth and to the divine at the same time, to be whole and complete. I love that. I'm going to ask the same question to you, Kaniki. So when you think of the healing that you've done over the years, you are um, an avid writer, journaler, poet, you use words. So you not only declutter your physical spaces, but you declutter your internal spaces through writing. What does holistic mean to you when we talk about this journey of healing? Well, it takes me back to the word holy. Um, which takes you back to God, which takes you back to um, speaking words, like we were just talking about affirmations, talking about being healed, right? So um, being, you know, someone who's had medical issues in the past, just saying, you know, I am healed when I wake up, I am healed, I am whole, you know, and it's not just about um, taking a medicine to fix it, right? Because the medicine, it fixes the... Um, the problems that you're having, it's not really fixing, um, it, it's, it's fixing what it's causing. It's not fixing the cause, right? So when you think of, when I think of holistic, I think about fixing the entire problem. You know what I mean? Like if, if you have something and you're like, it smells in here. So if you have trash and you're like, okay, I'm going to spray the Febreze, right? <laughs> well, you could just take the trash out when that's what's causing mm -hmm. it. Right? Okay. So I think about, you know, healing it, not just um, you know, taking a medicine to get rid of the symptoms for it, right? So not just the symptoms, but finding out, you know, holistically what's wrong with it. And I do think we have like the power of the mind, the power of the voice to, to heal ourselves. And I, so I think we, we need to be on a healing journey, which is why we're in the book, because we're on a healing journey, right? Exactly. And over and over again, through my years of doing this, um, you come across, you know, none of us is broken in the first place. 
it's not right. And so usually when you get in a group of healers, they will say that to remember, you know, that there's nothing that needs to be fixing. It's, it's something different than that. Um, so I'm going to ask the question just slightly differently to Susan and Sarah and see what they come up with here. But I posted recently in other than physical pain, which is the way that people understand this most easily, how do you know there's healing to be done? So Sarah, you want to tackle that one first? <laughs> And this is really just continuing our thread of, of holistic healing, you know? So how do I know? Let's, let's say it's not about physical pain. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the first piece that we start with is we're our own healers. And um, realizing that, you know, it's about connecting to our inner and inherent wisdom. And yes, there is much more and i feel that a lot of the pains and stuff can be in many levels that we have it can be in a spiritual it can be in um, our minds all of these different places that it can be and it can then express itself in the body so having it really looking if we go back to like the holistic that really looking at how they all interconnect i find is the way that has really brought um for my uh, clients that I've worked with and also for the things that I've done for myself has really brought me into more of a sense of having that sort of diversity of what's going on. And what I found is that depending on even whatever area it is, if we're sort of feeling separate for whatever reason that is, or compartmentalized or feeling lonely, um, like feeling a, really a, alone is we can feel that we're cut off to like the, the natural wisdom and healing that's around us. And one thing that I think is really important is creating a space that allows our bodies, allows our minds, allows our, all of us to relax, feel safe, and then we can go through whatever unwinding and, pro um, and process that we would need so that we can reconnect with our own wisdom. Oh man, you said something so important in terms of the process for most everybody I know, and that is that they have a safe space to heal. Because if you don't have that, then you'll never feel like you can go there in terms of feeling, because it's vulnerable to do that, right? You feel like you're literally, you know, like a dog turns over and shows mm -hmm. their belly and you just don't, you know, you're, you're used to doing the opposite. Um, and protecting yourself. Um, yeah, I love that. Um, and I think about that a lot. There are some people who haven't been able to access a safe space for healing, right? So part of what we're doing here with this book and also offering readers of the book a place to come. And I know it's corny to say it's a Facebook group, but it is. Um, I love Facebook. Facebook has connected me to more people across the globe than I could have ever imagined I would be connected with, you know? And so we're, offer we're offering that place in the group for readers to come and learn more and have a space to, you know, write questions and comments that they don't have to feel like are stupid or this or that, right? And we're doing these trainings and oh my gosh, it's been really amazing. Like, do you guys even know a book of, um, you know, a healer kind of influencer where you've had personal access to the author like this? I just think it's a massive gift that we're giving to people. So. Um, okay, so I'm going to go to you, Susan, and you can answer that, you know, we've been talking about a couple things, like why holistic and or, you know, if it's, if it's not a physical pain, like how do we even know there's healing to be, to be done or to be had? Mm, great question. I, one of the first things I say to my students, and I've been teaching for about 25 years is, can you die of pain? And they look at me and they're like, yes. Then I like to say, well, no, you can't die of pain. It's just an emotion. <laughs> so when you start hearing people talk about, uh, you know, like they say, starting out talking about their pain bodies, um, 
you know, what is, what emotion are they really tapping into? I um, want to just share my little story, a couple of things. I became the avalanche expert with my dog. We found everybody who was ever buried in an avalanche. And at the end of my book, I am the one who is buried. I get buried in my own avalanche emotionally. Mm. And I couldn't come out from under the snow metaphorically for eight months. So I was in deep pain. And one day I said, Oh my God, like I have to uncover myself. I have to get out from under this pain. And what is it? I was trying to understand it. I was a 45 year old woman, healthy. I was on top of the world. And then I got buried and it happens even to the best of us. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you asked, how do you know? Well, um, my life wasn't the same anymore. And I had to crawl my way out and ask for help. Mm. And I think, you know, asking for help is the hardest thing we'll ever do. Cause we're like super women. We can right. do everything. And then there's this whole collective of people, um, that we, you know, people can tap into for free. And it's like, you're the expert on pancreatic cancer. Wow. I have a question for you. And so just sharing the information, um, is key, you know, is key to, um, helping us heal. Yes. With an exclamation point. Mm. <laughs> yes, for sure. It is. And it is a powerful can, uh, question, Kinnicky. I, I know, um, Kinnicky was just messaging me that, uh, about being a powerful question. And I have asked that my whole career, like, because, people are constantly trying to figure this thing out, right? And unless they have physical pain, they don't even really know. I think, so we walk around in these lives where we've been taught they need to look this way. And so we check off all those boxes and we're still over here feeling not particularly great but we're not really sure why, because we've checked off all the boxes that everyone told us we were supposed to do, you know, to feel happy. So my answer, partial, partially answer to that question, you know, how do you know there's healing to be done? Um, you're in negativity more than positivity. Jeanette would relate to that one. You're, you're defaulting to meh, mediocre, kind of, eh, you know, I use these words kind of like, cause that's how it feels like, eh. and we were born for so much more than that. We were born to feel illegal amounts of joy. Those are my words from another book, you know? And so when I ask that question to people and they, oh, you can see it in their eyes and in their body, they, they're not even really sure what that means. They haven't given themselves permission to feel those things. They don't even know that's an end of us of the spectrum in possibility, right? And so when I think about it, how do you know that there's healing to be done? Well, um, you haven't tasted that yet, you know? And so that's just one, of course, one way to think about it. Um, did any one of you have another thought about that before we move on to something different? I think yeah. you feel it in your heart mm -hmm. if you allow yourself. Um, we're not taught to let our feelings be felt or exhibited outward. Um, we're taught, you know, to to think and to score well on a test and okay. to do this, this, and this. Um, so, you know, we're taught that boys aren't supposed to be showing their emotions and all of these um, uh, cultural norms that we grew up with um, have been very detrimental to us. So I, I think that now there's more awareness of feelings and of, of doing and, and kindness and allowing those good feelings to come out um, so I think that's one thing. Definitely. Thank you. 
Um, so I want to ask each of you um, just to think about the listeners and the people who are coming to this book and they're, you know, seekers and they're looking for different ways to heal and they have some awareness that that Western system, you know, maybe hasn't served them in the past and they love the idea of the mind, body, soul integration and this healing journey we're on. And so, you know, what would be one thing that you want to tell them about this journey in terms of your own experience? And I'll start to give you guys a little uh, push on this. But the thing that I like to remind people is that I know that that journey is scary as shit sometimes. And that a lot of the time you feel so alone in it. And some, I think it was Susan that said, or one of you said, you got to reach out. You have to ask for help. And asking for help sometimes is the hardest possible thing you can do because whatever that feeling is inside or whatever you've been taught about that, like, you know, you're not successful unless you do it all by yourself or, oh my gosh, the, you know, the inner critic uh, trash that we feed ourselves every day, those beliefs and thoughts. So what I know about this journey is that it, it's for warriors. It takes uh, an indomitable spirit. It takes a lot of things some days, but I also know that, um, you know, you can do it alone, but you probably shouldn't. <laughs> you know, we can sit there alone and we can be in it and we can struggle a lot, but there's um, a beautiful community, hence these beautiful faces you guys see today and are listening to that are ready and willing to help you grab your hand and say, hey, I've been where you've been and I know that we can do this together, right? There's such power in those kinds of connections and collaborations so, um, Sarah, what would be one thing that you would want the listeners to know about this journey? Um, a piece that I would like them to know is how all of us are on the journey and it's an ongoing process. And from how you talked about that, it's really, it's a really powerful and it does take a lot, but when you get to a point, the piece that we can get to is knowing that everything happens in the right time and place. And if you really have that really in the heart of like, okay, I can just do the things I can do. I can be it and it will start to unfold. I bet all of you have had experiences like that, that that's happened. And one I would really like to share was how, when I was named my Hawaiian name, which is Kawahine Ko Makani Nani, in the Hawaiian lineage. And yes, I go by short for Nani because that might be a little hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> you did that so beautifully. <laughs> yes. And that means the woman that glides on the gentle breezes. I've learned mm -hmm. so much from connecting with the wind and the wisdom of moving and slowing. But it brings me back to a really powerful point. I remember sitting in my living room with my, and I was picking up the phone and I called my mom. And in this call, when I told her about getting my Hawaiian name, there was totally no boundaries. There was just this sense of like, wow, we were all talking. We were both talking in the same page and there was no judgment. There was no nothing. It was just this greatness of pride. Of for, I was so proud of how she was listening to me, how she was showing her pride to me and her, how proud she was of me. The word I was trying to say there is proud, um, not pride. <laughs> um, but how proud she was. And it got me so much in my heart that that's where that came out. And that just there showed a little bit of my processing dis difficulty. But hey, it's all in the right time. And hey, anyone out there that's a reader and that's listening, yes, we can make mistakes. That's part of the process. And as we really step into who we are, what we are, and really just start doing that, it's amazing what can unfold. I mean, I just every day am so grateful from being sitting and, and being able to have gotten to a place that I'm here now in Maui. 
um, and really got to get to hear about all the teachings and stuff and now actually be here and be able to be part of the community to make change. It's amazing. Um, the readers are going to have a treat reading your story and understanding that journey. Thank you for being a part of this. Um, Susan, what's one thing you want the listeners to understand about this journey? In the writing of my memoir, um, and where I became a lost expert, <laughs> training a dog to find lost people, I realized at the end of my writing that I was lost as anybody I ever found. Oh. And so what I learned was that you can get lost in the woods, you can get lost in your health, you can get lost in a career, you can get lost in a relationship, in a business. And, you know, we're all trying to go down this path. And it's okay to get a little bit off the path you know, because we can self-correct, but we have to be careful not to get too far off the path because then it takes years of correction and a lot of people just give up. So what do I want people to walk away with? Yeah, it's normal to get off the path, but, you know, seek out, ask for help to try to get back on, on the path because it's complicated and, um, and empower yourself. We have the power to to do this and do self-correction. How do you know you're off? Yeah, how do you know you're off? Um, comments, maybe your friends might tell you. Um, you're awfully tired. You're not the person um, you used to be. Maybe you're drinking too much alcohol. By the way, I'm, uh, I stopped drinking alcohol a year ago. Woo! <laughs> Um, your diet is shit. Oh, <laughs> right. These are all little baby, you know, you're home eating a bag of popcorn instead of having a really nice meal. Okay. Yes. These are all signs that, you know, you're not on path and start self-correcting before it gets too late. Cause you know, it's a bear to, to get back on the path. It is. I appreciate you giving some examples because I think people are walking around a little zombie-ish. They don't even know they're off. They're just living that regular routine and the habitual patterns that they've kind of slowly gotten themselves into. And then you're lost in there and you don't even know that you're in there lost, right? And so I appreciate you giving some, some real examples. Those were perfect. Um, thank you. And all examples of what I've gone through in the past year. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not referring to anybody else. This happened to me. <laughs> yes. You, well, you made me think of something I was writing down a second ago, <laughs> and that is we teach what we most need to learn. Yeah. And that's always, you know, that's always happening. So um, I love that. Um, Jeanette, what's one thing you want the listeners to understand about this journey? That. We are more powerful than we even know, um, that there is nothing that you cannot do. Um, if you feel it, if you can envision it, you can make it happen. I love that. I love especially you're way more powerful than you know. Uh, what would you say to somebody who just doesn't know that? Where, where would somebody look first for a glimpse? Uh, I'll use the topic of self-care. And I'm so grateful that that is um, such a hot topic these days and it that is. people are buying into self-care. Um, when I was a young mom, you just did it all. You got up, you were at the bottom of the list, you just went from morning till dusk um, and there was never any, it was considered very selfish to even think about spending money on yourself or whatever. That was my um, sense as being a young mom. And now I'm just so grateful that people are taking the time to nurture their precious life force and honoring the gift of their life uh, because it truly is a gift. Um,
Yeah. Yeah. You're going to end there. Yeah, <laughs> That's good enough, so. right? Okay. I, think so. I, think so. <laughs> I thought there was more coming there. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I love it. Thank you. Um, Kinnicky, what's something you want the listeners to understand about this, this journey? Well, I got to thinking about um, when we're growing up, when we're children, and we'll always ask the question, what do you want to be when you grow up, right? <laughs> so when I was 28, I remember writing in my journal about this, and I said, I finally realized what I want to be when I grew up, and it is happy, <laughs> mm. right? So I think what I want people to most take away from the journey is there is nothing selfish about focusing on yourself. I love that. That is um, powerful. Je Jeanette's right too. Like self-care is a hot topic right now and it has been for a while, right? But I think that's because people finally realize that they've been taught that it's selfish when in fact it's necessary yes. because if you're not serving from an overflow, you're in your reserves and you are burning out. So how are you supposed to be a good mom or a good wife or a good friend or a good daughter or an employee or anything that you're doing when you're constantly trying to work from reserves, barely empty tanks, right? Yeah. So man, it's about time that self-care became a hot topic, you know? Um, and it's part of this movement of, of, it's part of this book about teaching people the tools and lots and lots of different ways you can nourish yourself. Yeah, we, so we need to um, understand. I wonder, so Kinnicky, for you, like just in terms of that idea, is that still a voice in your head? Oh, you're being selfish? Or have you kind of got that out of your, okay. Did you not, have I'm to? So I'm shaking my head. Um, no, <laughs> it's not because, you know, and then I think about how I was, I was going, when I was growing up, my mother was never that type of mother who um, put all of us first. She, yeah. she never was. She, she taught us that you needed self-care growing up. I mean, she said, I have three children. There's four weekends in a month. One of those weekends in a month belongs to me. So you need to find <laughs> something to do. And this was always, you know, the way that we was raised. So we never felt slighted or anything. As we got older, we would go with friends. But when we were younger, we would go with family members or whatever. My mom said, I'm taking my time. So I was taught that when I was younger, but I don't know how like you pick it up, you pick up that it's selfish to think about yourself. And I started to pick that up. But then I, you know, I said, and I know exactly when it was, it's when I was 28. So yeah, yeah so I'm in my 40s now. So I yeah. know that happiness is something that you share and not something that someone gives you. So mm. you, you just have to definitely work on that. Love it, thank you. All right, ladies, we got one more question and it's probably my favorite question of all time ever. It's also my very favorite writing prompt ever. And I'm gonna go down to Jeanette first and ask her, what do you love to do so much you lose track of time? You've heard me say this before. <laughs> yes, yes, I love that. Um, so one of them is writing. I love to write and I love everything about writing. I love the paper, the pens, the inspiration. I love the journals. I love if I'm typing on the keyboard, um, I lose track of time and also cooking. Mm. Oh my goodness. I don't know about you gals, but through the last few months, that has been one of the biggest gifts to me with this lockdown, pandemic, COVID, whatever you want to call it, was just the time to be with my daughter cooking the evening meal. And I've, I've felt so rushed in life before that, and we were missing out on that. And it took this, you know, there's been so many gifts actually with these last few months, even though I know it sucks for lots of reasons, but the slowdown for meal time for me was a big one. Um, and I, you're just making me think of it because I'm not sure I would have said cooking as the answer to that question for myself, but now I'm like, oh, I love this, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And it's because I needed the time 
to not feel rushed and just to smell the smells and have enough time to chop the onions and like, do, you know, and not feel like you were just getting to an end destination of eating the meal. Right. Um, yeah, right. so th thanks for that little moment. <laughs> now I'm hungry. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so Sarah, same question. What do you love to do so much you lose track of time? It's being in nature. If it's from hiking in a mountain to being in the ocean and swimming and then scuba diving for me, mm. getting to go deep down in the ocean and see such a different world is so calming mm -hmm. and just puts me into like a very meditative state. Uh, yes, beautiful. Um, thank you. You're you're having me now in the, in a floating uh, floating sense. Although, mm -hmm. you know, not everybody's love is everybody else's love, right? Scuba diving. Like I'm hearing scuba diving, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'd rather be jumping out of the helicopter. <laughs> you know, like I don't know about the underneath of the water thing, but. Um, Oh man, the nature connection is real though. And you guys, uh, this book, volume two, has a really interesting nature theme too. That's one of the ones I don't think I mentioned earlier. You guys are gonna hear lots of authors talk about nature connection in terms of healing. I absolutely love it. And I love how each of our ways of talking about the same kinds of things are different unique, amazing, the stories that go with them make that, you know, I always say to all of my writer people, we could line up a hundred people and they could all write about intuition, but you'd have a hundred different tools because of the unique story, the unique upbringing, the uniqueness of each human, right? That's one of my favorite things about these books, actually. Um, Susan, what do you love so much you lose track of time? I float the clear, cold waters of Northwest Montana, that border Glacier National Park is where I live now. <laughs> and, and then I ski the champagne powder. I was uh, at a, I was at my woo woo conference, you know, I call the, the healing stuff, woo woo stuff. I, <laughs> and I, I was given a name by a medicine man. He had to go think about it for a couple of days. I was there for a week and he comes back and he says, Susan, you have a new name. Uh -oh. This was many years ago. And I went, oh, he goes, you are um, machine hemlock woman. And I'm like, oh, what does that mean? And he said, one who flows with water. Oh. Hmm. So I do spend most of my time in water sources. The one you mentioned sounds way too cold for me. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Cold, cold. I grew up in California, you guys. So, you know, even though California, people think of it as being this hot place, the waters on the West Coast are not particularly yeah. warm. When mm -hmm. I moved to the East Coast and I went down to the Outer Banks and I put my little feet in that water, it was like a bathtub. And I was like, okay, this is how it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, pretty funny though. Um, Awesome. So you and Sarah share this thing where you were named by, oh, you guys have different names for these healer masters that have been in the world learning these ancient healing. Yeah, I know. I like, I can see the head nods here. If you're just listening, just know that we're all nodding our head right now. Um, it's so powerful, right? It is so powerful. I love it. Um, Kaniki, what do you love to do so much you lose track of time? I like to write. Um, I like to sit by the water. And uh, I think at the top of the list is nothing. <laughs> Amen. Yes. Oh my goodness. What a great answer. I would like to do nothing once in a while too. That would be good. I'm such a doer. I've, I've always got the doer energy going in me. Um, really important to connect to, to the nothingness now and again. 
Ladies, thank you so much for being here today. Listeners, um, in our show notes today, you're going to have the bios that I read about the ladies, and you're also going to have their websites linked up for you. So please go explore. If you heard something today that was just sparking your interest, go explore their websites. We, of course, are you know getting ready to launch this Ultimate Guide to Self-Healing Volume 2 coming out in July. But until then, there are a lot of resources to explore. You can find me and everything Brave Healing at bravehealer.com. I'll hook you up there with that as well. And um, just highly suggest that you come meet these wonderful people, get into their worlds, see the offerings that they have out right now, read their books, say their affirmations, get into their writing workshops. You guys, um, we have some amazing, amazing authors on this roster and um, y'all are, are such wonderful, beautiful, big fat gifts to the world. So thank you all. Um, all right, you guys. So until next time, uh, we will be, uh, well, we're going to be in a lot of places for you, but the last thing that I kind of want you to remember today, this is for all of my fellow healers who are on the journey. Um, I know that you're a warrior for being here, but what I want you to remember is you were born, so you are worthy. Your message matters. And what if the thing you're still a little afraid to share is exactly what someone needs to hear to change or even save their life? It's time to be brave, you guys. See you next time. Bye.